Bonjour. Good morning, everyone. Uh, dear delegates, dear friends, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is James Crow. I'm president of EASPD. Uh, together with Emmanuel Constant uh, from LADAPT, uh, we speak to you now to welcome you to this conference. Uh, it will be very different from the conferences that all of us have been, have been used to, but we do hope sincerely that you will still learn, share, and enjoy uh, our time together. This tragedy is something that we are all living through, but hopefully, I would like to believe that it will bring us closer together as citizens and as societies. Yes, national borders have closed, but in the longer term, the only way forward is for us, as citizens and societies, to work together, to fight and respond to this horrible virus, and to find the, the solutions, the vaccines, uh, that will give us all the, the path to safety. But this is a very different uh, uh, day for us as, as, uh, as delegates. There are over 750 people registered and uh, the many people are joining as I speak from the four corners of Europe and from beyond. ESPD is a network of over 17,000 organizations from across 33 countries. And we are active in, in articulating the wishes of the service providing and support services sector uh, to assist people with disabilities uh, to make their way in life. Um, This Road to Employment, our conference for persons with disabilities, is a, a, a valuable opportunity to come together and to share. Employment is one of the key uh, aspects of life. And at this time of crisis, when so many people are unemployed, it's even more important that we as a sector uh, fight for the rights of people with disabilities um, to take their place in society, in employment, uh, and not to be left behind as the response to the COVID crisis takes shape. So I would argue that far from being at the margins of our concerns today as citizens, this conference should be at the center of our concerns. The risk is that if we do not speak up uh, alongside disabled people's organizations, if we do not advocate for people with disabilities to get jobs and provide the practical assistance to help them, they will be at the back of the queue. We find ways to counter that. So those, that is the, uh, the framing that I'm giving to, to our, our our time together in this new format. It is a great pity that we are not in Paris with our friends and colleagues and that we are all together. But I am convinced that we will find ways through this Zoom conference to connect better and connect well um, for the future. I now need to offer to you a couple of points about the conference. Hopefully you have all received um, written information through emails about the conference content. Uh, you have seen how to take the YAP app and that is a great a way of getting very quickly into all of the details of the conference, whether it's speakers, whether it's the program, and there are also opportunities within the app for speaking and offering feedback. Zoom can only work if people log on and register 
Um, and so you will have had a number of emails about how you register and how you join different parts of the conference. It's most important that you look at those uh, and, and read them and act upon them. There is technical support available from our, our great team uh, in Brussels, our staff team, um, particularly from a technical side, from, uh, from Zoe and from Zoe Radu and from Renaud Schauer, who has joined us a few months ago. Um, so those are the, some of the technical aspects of, this, of introducing this conference. Please um, do look carefully at the, at the, at the schedule. Um, and uh, if you have questions, please send emails back to the technical team and they will just try and assist you. Now, this uh, wonderful uh, communication technology of Zoom, I should say one or two remarks about this technology. Uh, if you look at the screen before you, there is a bar at the bottom of the page. And uh, there, if, uh, you, if any of us as speakers are unclear, there is an option for you to uh, take subtitles of what we are saying. So if you click on the button that is labeled in English, closed caption, you will be able to see subtitles in the language that is being spoken by the uh, presenter at the time. So you should go to the closed caption uh, option, the button, and then you should click on the right of the middle bar and show which is labeled show subtitles. There is language interpretation here you will see the, uh, the, the little um, icon on the bottom right of the bar. Uh, language interpretation is available in English and French, and it also in Spanish, but, but uh, for some technical reason, what's shown is English, French, or Croatian. Please rest assured, if, you are, if you're a Spanish speaker and you would like to hear a Spanish translation, go to the interpretation, interpretation bar click on it and click the Croatian option. So for these two days, if you are Spanish, you will, for, or a Spanish speaker, you will be a Croatian in terms of using our, our interpretation. If you have comments about what is being said uh, as the presenters speak, uh, please use the Q and A button uh, or if that is for, if you want to put questions and if you have comments more broadly, please use the chat button. You will see that there is an option there too. And I know I can see many of you are actually utilizing that chat option now. Um, the app, as I said, is available. There were details on it in emails sent to you. Um, and uh, I would encourage you to use that. I am now very pleased to hand over to my dear colleague, Emmanuel Constant uh, from Redact. Oui. <coughs> Bonjour à tous. Bonjour à tous, chers amis de l'EASPD, euh, cher Jim, cher Luc, cher Fabrizio. Je suis très heureux, en tant que président de l'ADAPT, et co-organisateur de cette conférence, de vous accueillir nombreux. Bien sûr, j'aurais préféré que nous soyons tous réunis à Paris. Un grand merci à l'EASPD pour l'initiative de cette rencontre, malgré toutes les difficultés. Je remercie les associations françaises amies au sein de l'EASPD, les associations qui nous ont aidés à organiser cette rencontre. L'UNAPI, Nexem, 
et le centre de la Gabrielle. Aujourd'hui, je pense très fort à toutes les personnes handicapées qui sont confinées, qui peuvent être seules, malades, isolées. Soyons vraiment solidaires tous ensemble auprès d'elles. Pour l'ADAPT, le thème de notre conférence « En route vers l'emploi » Road to Employment est un thème très important. Depuis 90 ans, l'ADAPT, association reconnue d'utilité publique, milite pour le travail, l'emploi et l'inclusion des personnes handicapées. Chaque année, nous soignons, nous formons, nous accompagnons près de 20 000 personnes handicapées dans 120 établissements en France, avec plus de 3000 salariés et des centaines de bénévoles. L'ADAPT organise chaque année avec la Commission européenne, avec le Parlement, avec d'autres associations européennes, la Semaine européenne pour l'emploi des personnes handicapées. Nous le faisons avec de nombreuses entreprises et avec l'appui de l'AGFIP, c'est un grand événement qui aide des milliers de travailleurs à trouver un emploi. Oui, en route pour, vers l'emploi, c'est fondamental. C'est fondamental pour les droits des personnes handicapées et pour l'inclusion. Il faut une stratégie claire et des objectifs concrets et ambitieux au niveau de toute l'Europe dans ce domaine. Aujourd'hui, et Jim Crow l'a dit, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec lui, aujourd'hui l'emploi des personnes handicapées est gravement menacé en France et ailleurs, gravement menacé par la crise du coronavirus. C'est une menace sérieuse et urgente. Aussi, l'emploi des personnes handicapées doit être une priorité encore plus grande et urgente. Et c'est à nous, à nous dans cette conférence et avec toutes les associations qui sont représentées, de le dire très haut. Et c'est à nous d'agir ensemble. En terminant, je voudrais annoncer que l'ADAPT organise avec ses partenaires européens deux événements en ligne pour la fin du mois de juin, une présentation de nos travaux sur la sécurisation des parcours professionnels, ce qu'on appelle DESC2, et un travail sur l'inclusion par l'art, ISA. L'inclusion par l'art, la culture, c'est aussi une forme d'inclusion importante. Je vous souhaite à tous une excellente conférence en route vers l'emploi Merci de votre attention. Hello, good morning. That's Fabrizio Fea. I'm with you now. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sydney for this very nice uh, uh, video. We were all in Paris, even if we are still at home, in our homes. So, uh, welcome again. Uh, to this uh, first session of our of our conference. The first session is about co-production of new opportunities. Uh, first, I would like again to repeat the way that you can join us. A bit, some remind of housekeeping. So, first of all, you have the bar under the screen and you can activate the subtitles by clicking on the button, close caption, on the right of the middle bar, and then you show uh, the subtitles. Uh, please, just to remind you, the subtitles, uh, and, and, and you have translation also, sorry, and for the translation, you have English, French, and Croatian. Uh, for some reasons, the uh, Croatian translation, you have it 
under the flag of Spain. There isn't any Spanish translation, okay? So remind that. Spain flag for Croatian translation. Uh, that you will have the interpretation. Uh, then you have the button, Q&A button for questions and answers and in the middle bar. Uh, and last of not least, you have the app. So use the app as well. Now, uh, I go immediately to our presentations. As you may see on the screen, we have four top class presenters, key persons that will introduce and present their, uh, they have their presentation. The four persons are uh, Malika Bucehova, president of AG FIF, FIF uh, Ouvrir l'emploi aux personnes handicapées, uh, Jürgen Menz, disability inclusion from ILO, Valeria Bouchan from Slovenia, and Hayden Hammersley uh, from EDF. They, have, they will have 10 minutes each for the presentation. And at the end of the four presentations, we will have um, question and answers. Uh, so we will start with uh, uh, Malika Bucehiova. As I said, she's president of OGFIF. Uh, Malika, the floor is yours. Just to remember, that uh, you will, uh, she will focus on the specificities of unemployment of persons with disabilities in France and how to foster, foster sorry, new opportunities efficiently in this context. So Malika, again, the floor is yours. Okay. Cher um, Emmanuel Constant, cher collègue ESPD, cher ami, bonjour. Merci à l'ADAPT pour son invitation et pour l'organisation de ce colloque dans un contexte très particulier. Un contexte qui nous interpelle tous, au niveau européen, mais aussi au niveau mondial. Une situation qui nous conduit à repenser nos actions et surtout nos priorités. Tout d'abord, permettez-moi de vous présenter la structure AGFIP. C'est une structure pour développer l'inclusion de toutes les personnes handicapées dans l'emploi. Elle est créée par une loi, une loi qui date de 1987. Cette loi a instauré en France une obligation d'employer 6% de personnes handicapées dans les entreprises privées. Cette obligation a par ailleurs été renforcée par une loi de 2005 et à élargir, bien sûr, cette obligation sur le secteur public. C'est une organisation, la GIFI, paritaire. Ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire qu'elle est organisée par des représentants de l'entreprise, par des représentants syndicaux salariés, et surtout des associations des personnes en situation handicapée. C'est une organisation présente dans toutes les régions qui propose des services à l'ensemble des territoires. Le rôle de la GIFIP, c'est surtout de construire et financer des solutions pour compenser les conséquences du handicap au travail. Elle soutient les acteurs de l'emploi, de la formation et les entreprises pour prendre en compte des besoins spécifiques. La situation qu'on qu vit aujourd'hui, c'est une situation particulière. Elle touche tout le monde, et en particulier les personnes en situation d'handicap. Il faut qu'on soit extrêmement vigilant. Pour ce faire, nous avons travaillé avec des acteurs pour mettre en œuvre des mesures exceptionnelles permettant de satisfaire et d'aider le maintien des personnes en situation d'handicap pendant cette période-là. Ça passe par exemple par l'accompagnement des personnes au télétravail, pour les équiper des matériaux et des équipements technologiques leur permettant d'assurer leur travail à distance. Toute une série de mesures exceptionnelles, avec un budget de 23 millions d'euros, mis à disposition des acteurs, les personnes en situation de handicap, les entreprises, pour assurer le maintien des personnes au travail. Nous travaillons aujourd'hui et surtout pour le pré-déconfinement. 
comme vous le savez, la France, à compter du 11 mai, passe sur une période de déconfinement. Nous souhaitons être extrêmement sensibles et vigilants sur la période à venir. Donc, C'est une vision, certes, de court terme, mais c'est une vision nécessaire pour accompagner et surtout être vigilant sur cette tendance euh, donc de maintien pour les personnes dans le temps à venir. Cette mobilisation, elle doit se faire avec l'ensemble des acteurs, avec l'ensemble des parties prenantes, avec l'ensemble de nos partenaires. L'échelon européen est pour nous, pour l'emploi des personnes en situation de handicap, très important. Mon cher collègue Emmanuel Constant l'a signalé tout à l'heure, il faut à tout prix, il est impératif de définir une stratégie handicap. On le sait très bien, définir une stratégie au niveau national, certes c'est bien, mais la définir sur un échelon européen, c'est encore meilleur. La définition donc d'une stratégie à l'échelon européenne pour l'emploi des personnes en situation d'handicap est très importante, nous le savons tous. L'Europe a déjà établi des lignes fortes pour l'emploi des personnes en situation handicapée. Elle est certes encourageante, mais sûrement il faut la croître dans la période qui s'ouvre devant nous, une période qui s'avère difficile. Nous serions, au sein de la GIFIC, très heureux de pouvoir contribuer aux réflexions, aux actions conduites dans ce cadre. Nous pouvons y apporter tout ce que l'AGIFIP a pu rassembler comme bonne pratique, expérience, projet, innovation, et cela depuis 35 ans. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Malika, for your uh, presentation. You have been more than in time, uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our, so I go to our next speaker. It's Jürgen Mense from ILO and GBDN. Uh, Jürgen will focus on the role of ILO and GBDN in fostering employment of persons with disability at an international level. Which are the biggest bottlenecks they find on the way and, they, and the uh, key partners and ways to convince employers Uh, to work hand in hand with support services and with uh, disabled persons organizations. Uh, please, uh, Jürgen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fabrizio, and good morning to all of you. Um, before I go into my presentation about the work we do with employers, let me just quickly introduce the ILO for those who, who are not very familiar with, with our organization. And let me also say a few words about what we have been doing Uh, to address COVID, the COVID crisis from a disability inclusion perspective, and then I'll, I'll go into the presentation. Just to mention, of course, that the International Labour Organization, unlike other UN entities, um, has not only the governments as its constituent, but also the most representative employers' organizations and workers' organizations of the over 180 member states. And of course, in the area of disability inclusion, we, we consult with organizations of persons with disabilities too. Um, and, and of course, we had to shift a lot of our work uh, due, to the, 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 due to the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, I, I all invite you all, if you haven't seen our products, um, to go on ilo.org slash disability where you will find a one pager available in the UN uh, six UN languages plus Portuguese and German on what we think are the key issues to keep in mind when you address COVID-19 and how to make it inclusive of persons with disabilities in the world of work in the labor market. There's also a joint statement um, that Uh, ILO contributed to, to the social protection of persons with disabilities in this ongoing crisis, which we of course know is an instrument, ins important instrument, important tool to address the negative economic impact of this crisis. Also, just to mention that tomorrow, the 5th of May, the UN Secretary General will issue a policy brief on COVID-19 and disability inclusion. So please uh, be alert to that. It will also have a section on And on economic issues, including employment. I will now sh start sharing my screen. Um, 
because as I, as I mentioned, we, as ILO, we work with trade unions, we work with governments and employers, and the work with the employers is, is very much led um, by the ILO Global Business and Disability Network, which basically brings our thinking and practices and tools uh, together in, in, a, in a single framework for employers. It has been around for almost 10 years now. And the overall mission is simply well, simply, it sounds simple, but of course, it's a lot of work supporting companies in making the employment policies and practices inclusive, inclusive of persons with disabilities around the world. And why around the world? Because we uh, have global companies as uh, members in our network. You will see on this, those who can see uh, the slide will see the logos of the 24 multinational enterprises that are currently part of the Global Business and Disability Network, the GBDN. Um, and you will see also many of them are actually based in Paris. So <laughs> some of them might have actually uh, been able to come if, if the conference, com uh, conference would have happened in person. So we have 24 national, multinational enterprises on board. And the, the main challenge, or one of the main challenges they face, making sure that what they have in place in terms of policies, procedures, practices, when it comes to, to the inclusion of persons with disabilities in their business operations, is to make it effective wherever they work. It might be very good in, in, in France, it might be very good in Germany or the US and the UK, but what happens if they go to, or if, if they then operate in countries where the legal environment, where the policy environment, where the infrastructure is much more challenging. So that's, that's, that's an area where we very much support these companies. But you will also see that um, uh, we also not only have global companies as our membership base, they are the main, let's say the primary uh, members and the, uh, the, 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 the network is very much run by these global companies. But you also see that uh, we have more than 30 national business and disability networks as our members. And these national business and disability networks exist around the world, from North America, South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Mediterranean Sea, Europe, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia. So this is a concept that has been uh, very successful around the world especially in the last, let's say, three, four years, more and more of these national networks have come up. And oftentimes, we in the ILO support processes that lead to the establishment of national business and disability networks. At the same time, we, uh, so in addition to the global companies and in addition to the national business and disability networks, uh, we have nine supporting non-business organizations uh, as part of the global business and disability network, because oftentimes companies are looking for disability specific expertise and either NGOs or DPOs can, can provide this. And you will also see, of course, the International Disability Alliance is part of, of our network. And you will see here now, I'm going into the governance structure, how, it, how is this uh, global business and disability network actually governed and you see there that the International Disability Alliance is also part of our steering committee as a voice of persons with disabilities. At the same time, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, global companies take the lead in this network. So they are the, the primary um, members of the steering committee. And each year there's a uh, chair and vice chair uh, that keep rotating. Currently, we have Repsol, the Spanish uh, uh, multinational energy company, as the chair of the network, and L'Oreal, uh, the vice chair for this year and will become the chair next year. Uh, we also have one national business and disability network in the steering committee, which is currently one, the one in, from Sri Lanka. And we in the ILO, uh, we provide the technical secretariat. So um, preparing meetings, uh, preparing tools, um, keeping the discussion running. Uh, let me just go quickly because I think uh, I don't want to take too much time, but we basically summarize what we do in these four areas. We say, look, companies, you can uh, learn from each other and share with other global leaders. You have access to country-specific business and disability insights. As I mentioned before, it's very key for multinational companies to know what is existing and what is possible in specific countries. Then we generate cutting-edge knowledge, guidance, tools, 
And of course, we also provide a platform for companies to actually show, uh, to, to allow them to showcase what they're doing in disability inclusion. They might do a good job. It might be on their website, but it might not reach always a, a, a bigger audience. So let me just give you a few examples in these four areas. So how do we do that? Learning and share, learning from each other and sharing with other global leaders. Of course, there are a lot of conferences. And of course, this year, of course, we, we cannot have the face-to-face -face meetings we had in the past. Last year in November, we had a major conference with uh, more than 300 uh, people participating in person uh, in Geneva, where the ILO headquarters is based. We were looking into how can we make the future of work more inclusive for persons with disabilities. Of course, the traditional, let's say the traditional uh, challenges still exist. Physical uh, accessibility is not always there digital accessibility, stigma, discrimination, all of that is still there. But then we, we're trying to focus on, okay, what do we already have to think about now to make sure that inequalities are not uh, repeated in the future. Uh, then we also try to bring, bring the global business and disability network closer to specific world regions. Uh, yearly, we have one in Latin America, but then also we, we, we having conferences, or we had conferences now in, uh, uh, Southern Africa and uh, North America. We were thinking this year actually to go into Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, but okay, we know face-to-face -face meetings are not possible at, at this stage. So then on this slide, we have also webinars and that will be of course more and more important during, during this, um, the, the necessi necessity of physical distancing. And we already had a webinar specifically on COVID-19 facilitated by the Global Business and Disability Network. It is also available on our website, businessanddisability.org. So the second point I mentioned, yes? Two minutes. I'm running out of time. Two minutes, okay. Um, just to mention also on our website, you will find a lot of country profiles with specific information on what is going on in, I think we have around 70 countries now, some information. So if you're a company and want to know what's happening in Kenya, in Bolivia, the Philippines or India, you'll find that information there. And then I mentioned cutting edge knowledge. Uh, of course, we, we produce a lot of publications and guidance um, and we we structure, structured the work of the Global Business and Disability Network this year along the four areas recruitment of persons with disabilities because oftentimes companies even if they're interested they still struggle in how how they actually attract and retain people with disabilities we focused on we, we are going to focus on digital accessibility more important than ever during this this time of crisis we're also looking into neurodiversity and then global company policies and practices in workplace adjustments, or as, as, you, as you know, we call it a reasonable uh, accommodations. But of course, with COVID-19, a lot of that work needs to be uh, shifted around. So we're now um, producing also uh, products under uh, uh, the area of COVID-19. We're actually gonna send out in the coming days a survey to the national business and disability networks to invite them to approach their respective company members in their respective countries to find out what has happened ever since the crisis hit them and how have people with disabilities, workers with disabilities uh, been affected. And we also have a self-assessment tool. I don't want to go into this, but check it out on our website if you have time. And then the last one, just to, just to mention that, uh, yes, we have, of course, the uh, webinars, the meetings, uh, we have the website, we have a newsletter in English and Spanish every two months. And of course, we have a LinkedIn space. And then the last point, I invite you just to watch on our website, a global disability awareness campaign, where of course, persons with disabilities themselves are featured in uh, expressing the, what we call then invalid opinions by many people without disabilities about their work capacities in an attempt to address uh, the stereotypes and stigma that many people with disabilities still face today. So it's an invalid opinions campaign. We would be very happy if you watch it on YouTube, share it and uh, promote it. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer the questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jürgen, and thank you for being, uh, uh, for keeping in time. Uh, as I mentioned before, everything has to be very strict uh, working in, uh, 
in this in this uh, way. So we go to our next speaker. Our next uh, speaker is Valeria Bunshan uh, from Slovenia. Uh, she will focus on the practice she leads in, uh, in her country, how the context in Eastern European countries can differ, and how to work hand in hand with disabled person organizations and with employers. Valeria, uh, I cannot see you in this moment. Uh, let me see. Hello. Okay, you are there. The floor is yours, Valeria. Thank you, Fabrizio. Um, yeah. Um, I will try to be on time. Uh, we all know that uh, being employment <clears throat> is much more than right. It's not just the payment we receive. Uh, work we perform enables us to learn and uh, gain knowledge and experience throughout the whole life, developing uh, individuality and inclusion in interpersonal relationships. This can be achieved in the workplace as well as other places connected with work. It can also be abroad if job is on international level. This indirectly helps us to develop our personal and social development. Most of the time we think that people with special needs are only employable in simple, sometimes repetitive jobs, and we do not include them in more demanding or creative jobs. However, this is often due to the stereotypes and also in the educational programs they attend during the school period. So I would like to present many years of experience in engaging in creative and challenging jobs in Slovenia, which are a consequence of the educational programs and training that they attend in childhood and the period of education. Uh, we can, um, I hope that you see uh, PowerPoint. Uh, we can, um, we, we know that employment is a right. So we have to find a new way how to introduce uh, new methods and work with users. And we have to think about a new new challenges how to do in um, uh, how to involve them to uh, the process and uh, to find a new training modification so we have to think about new skills new knowledge and new point of view how we will preventing resistance we have to think about is there consent that change is needed are the numerous solutions for each problems? Are there available options? Do the people benefit or lose with the current situation? Are they aware of negative consequences? What beliefs, habits, behaviors are affected by the change? Do the people understand and believe the changes brings benefits? Are the workers ensure that they have long-term support for realization of a various plans? Is the process enacted without manipulation? In the next few slides, I will present the good practice of different types of work from our experience. So they work with animals, but they can be beekeeper. Um, they can work in bee house. Uh, they can take a care for bee. They can work in vineyard. They can uh, help to prepare uh, vineyard, but they can uh, work in wine cellar. They can try to help to sell, uh, to promote uh, wine uh, and this kind of uh, work. They are really well in uh, fashion shows. Uh, they like to do this. And uh, I think that it's good if, uh, we invited uh, the best uh, fashion um, producer in Slovenia and they prepare different clothes for them. Um, it's nice that uh, people can see that we are not all nice and young and uh, we can uh, also look very well. Uh, they can be a photo models. Few companies uh, invite them to work with them, so they are very nice and they can uh, they are very proud to do this. 
we all know that uh, they are very um, creative in a different way. But if we uh, check in a gallery, uh, national gallery or shops with art uh, things, we can see uh, a lot of their uh, products. So we have to put uh, their work in a normal community, in a normal uh, gallery, and we will recognize them that they are really uh, very creative. They um, are very well in the music, but if we don't train them uh, to use uh, instruments uh, when they are young, we can't, um, they can't do this when they are older. Uh, they like to uh, be actors. Uh, we have very good experience in Slovenia. Uh, two national theater invited them uh, to be actor. They act in a normal um, theater performance like all other actors. And uh, our experience showed that the performance were so good that our government choose this performance for a, a national celebration of Independence Day. And um, it's good because in this celebration were president of Slovenia with uh, his wife and premier of Slovenia and ombudsman and a lot of political elite. And it was there a lot of journalists. So they promote very well uh, people with special needs. They uh, like culture things. Uh, we have to give them chance to work in a library, to uh, be a part of uh, different um, culture events. Uh, uh, they like to be all around um, uh, when uh, it's, uh, for instance, they are good poets and uh, everything else. For people who are um, more technical, it's good to be photograph. Uh, it's um, uh, possible to arrange their, this kind of work that they can be successful. This is one case, uh, photo trailer. Uh, uh, he, uh, this boy uh, uh, visit a lot of events and uh, uh, it was in uh, different birthday parties and wedding parties. So uh, he was very successful with the other way of work, with uh, the photograph. Then uh, we can include them in uh, uh, tourism. Uh, they, uh, they normally they work in a kitchen and in, uh, uh, they, they are uh, waiters, but they can be in uh, hotels, they can work in a reception, they can help uh, to uh, support uh, guests. But they can be a tourist guys uh, too because uh, people who are tourists uh, need sometimes more easy explanation and uh, they are uh, very well in the tourism. Valeria, uh, we invite, for you please. Uh, yeah, we invite them in a cooking show and uh, different uh, and our protocol invite them to be a part of a protocol. You can recognize that they were with different uh, uh, important political guests. So if we want to be successful, we have to have solid political will. We have to be an active and democratic uh, leadership at working places. We have to have good retraining, new methods of uh, and organization, participation of civil society, a commitment to users' rights and their empowerment, and coordination of activities, good monitoring and routing process based in evaluation and research. So we have to inform and explore. We uh, give them in uh, all different activities like uh, Expo in Milano. They uh, were in Malta in the former guests from former president and our uh, president of Slovenia baked with them uh, Christmas uh, biscuits for uh, the other kids in Slovenia. So it's necessary to work together uh, with uh, government, no government entities. It's important to cooperate with policy creators and local as well as national level. And it's important to uh, inform general public through different means and activities and community, and we have to use media to make social services more popular and understood. 
And the most important is that they have to have a good educational program when they are young. Thank you, Fabrizio. Thank you very much, Valeria. Absolutely interesting. And again, I would like to remind to our participants uh, uh, to use question and answers if you do have some for our panelists. Don't be shy, of course. Now, I would like to go to our uh, next uh, speaker. Uh, it's uh, Hayden Hammersley from EDF. Um, uh, Hayden, the floor is yours. Thank you, Valeria, again. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, first of all, very much for having me with you today. Um, so I'm from the European Disability Forum, and today I was going to speak to you about what we see as being some of the main problems for persons with disabilities when looking uh, for work. Um, I please a little bit louder, if it's possible. Oh, you can, okay. Thank you. Can you hear me a bit better? Ah, that's fine, thank you. Yeah. Um, I will also speak about why we see employment as being important for persons with disabilities on a, on a personal level. And then look at briefly at some of the ways that we can uh, possibly improve the situation a little bit. So in terms of context, the main thing um, to point out is, as we all know, that the rate of employment for persons with disabilities is far below that of persons without disabilities. Um, so at EDF, we recently produced um, a research paper uh, that actually I can share the link afterwards in the chat box for you. We have it in accessible PDF and in an easy to read version. And this research, it looks mostly at poverty for persons with disabilities, but within that we look at uh, employment. Uh, and what we found is at, when looking at EU figures, it shows that only around 50% of persons with disabilities um, are in employment, uh, compared to around 75% for persons without disabilities. Um, and then when we look at the situation of women with disabilities, uh, it's even worse. So around 48% of women with disabilities are employed. Um, and even these figures actually are quite um, optimistic, we would say, because uh, they don't show things such as the quality of employment. Um, we know, for example, that many persons with disabilities uh, have precarious uh, working contracts when they're in the open labor market, um, often paid uh, at minimum wage. And these figures also don't count the many persons with disabilities who live in institutional care uh, in the EU. So all of that to say that these, these, are, these figures are probably slightly optimistic and also they come from before the, the crisis that we're currently in. So in the years to come, unfortunately, we're likely to see the situation being, being even worse. Uh, when we look at some of the main issues that persons with disabilities face when uh, looking for work. One of the main things um, is, and I should say that at EDF we look very much at employment um, in the open labour market or services that lead people eventually to the open labour market. Um, and one of the main issues we see is um, a lack of reasonable accommodation uh, being offered. Um, and as we know, often reasonable accommodation can be very simple things. It can often be a question of just being quite flexible with your, with your staff. And uh, I think something we've seen during this current um, crisis with COVID-19 is that employers actually can be quite flexible when they, when they need to. Um, uh, so that's something we would like to see kind of carried on in the future. Um, another issue as well that persons with disabilities face is the link between uh, the disability entitlements that some people receive and the ability to be in paid employment. Um, so what we see is in most countries when you begin paid work you lose your entitlements to government um, uh, benefits as they're sometimes called, uh, government entitlements. 
And actually, this is a, quite a big risk for many persons with disabilities. Um, figures show that of the 50%, more or less, of persons with disabilities in employment in the EU, around 11% are at risk of being in, in work poverty, so that their um, earnings aren't enough to actually cover all of the costs that they have as persons with disabilities. Um, there are a few countries where you can continue working and for a certain amount of time or up to a certain salary you can keep your disability um, entitlements and uh, given how expensive it often is to live as a person with a disability, I think this is uh, something that's, that's crucial. Um, so why is it that employment is so imp important for persons with disabilities? Well, I think it's really the, the same as uh, for anyone. It doesn't make a, a difference if, you're, if you have a disability or not. Um, employment is a way of finding your place in society. It gives you connection with the people around you. Um, it gives you a feeling of uh, self-worth. So it's not just about, as was mentioned by a previous speaker, it's not just about uh, having, having money. Um, it, it's really about how it makes you feel and making sure you're not cut off from the society around you. Um, and uh, yeah, for, for many persons with, a dis uh, with disabilities, being in employment can make the difference between feeling connected and having a sense of worth. And I have to say another thing that's quite interesting uh, with the COVID-19 crisis that we're currently living through and perhaps a silver lining for the future could be um, that, uh, well, sometimes persons with disabilities in the open labor market, if they have high support needs, uh, and especially, for example, those with an intellectual uh, disability, uh, might end up in employment, for example, in a supermarket, uh, in food production, in cleaning, uh, in deliveries. And I think with the crisis, we're in now, we've really come to see that actually these services uh, are crucial and they're really, you know, um, noble professions. And I hope that this is something that we remember going forward and that we uh, convey this message to persons with disabilities doing this job, that really they're playing a crucial role uh, for all of us and that we should be grateful for the, the work they're doing. But this is just a, a reflection that I've had recently that, trying to think of possible uh, silver linings to this horrible situation that, that we're currently in. And then uh, finally, some of the things we can do to perhaps um, in the short term and in the long term uh, to improve the situation. Uh, well, as mentioned, a lot can be done through um, better ensuring reasonable accommodation adjustments in the workplace. Um, as I mentioned, we've seen how flexible employers can be during this crisis um, with uh, allowing people to work from home and so on. An important thing to remember, though, is that uh, working from home should be an option, so it shouldn't be forced upon uh, employees with a disability, um, and it shouldn't be an excuse for not making a workplace uh, accessible. So. If it's requested, it should be enabled, but it shouldn't be something that's, that's forced. I think the EU could play a bigger role, perhaps, when it comes to reasonable accommodation with um, harmonizing some minimum standards, partly for employers to know what their obligations are, but really a lot for the member states, for the governments to know uh, what they need to do to, in, to, to support the employers. So um, what financial incentives, uh, what kind of organizational support they should give to employers. Um, I think that's, that would be really crucial. And it's not something that uh, we see evenly throughout the member states. Some countries do it well and others not so much. Um, it would also be really useful to see more information going to the employers themselves, um, for them to understand how simple, often reasonable accommodation can be. Um, because I think often employers think it's going to be something very difficult and most of the time, it's just a question of sitting down with the person with a disability and asking them what they need. Often the reasonable accommodation is free, it's just being uh, flexible. And when uh, purchases do need to be made for technology and so on, 
um, to have more information as to where you can get reimbursed for this. For example, in Belgium, the regions uh, reimburse these reasonable accommodation uh, and technology for persons with disabilities. Um, Co-production definitely has an important role to play. Um, uh, I think particularly for persons who have uh, higher support needs, who might need one-on-one -on -one, uh, support or mentoring, um, not just for getting the job, but also for being able to uh, maintain the job and to build um, experience and to kind of explore more the areas where they have talents and where they have interests. Um, and another thing that would be really interesting to focus on is um, this uh, idea of job carving. So we've seen it, it's not the only solution and it's not a perfect solution, but it's something that is quite interesting. We've seen EU funds be used for this. Uh, so job carving um, essentially uh, is within a, a business or, or any employment sector. Um, introducing a person uh, with a disability into the team and taking certain bits of the tasks uh, of the current employ employees to create a new role. So taking small tasks that the person can do within their, um, their ability and their capacity. And that's something we've seen in Malta, for example, and uh, it seems to work quite well. So this would be really interesting to explore. And then my very last point, which I actually already mentioned earlier, um, this is a more long-term thing. We really need to see a change of uh, attitudes and also the, the value that we give to the work that persons with disabilities do. Um, we often hear the term low-skilled work. Um, and I think th this crisis has shown us, uh, the COVID-19 crisis has shown us that there really is no such thing as, as low-skilled work. And... Uh, Two minutes, please. Your yes, uh, and um, thank you. Yeah, the, the, all lines of work really need to be given uh, recognition and, and to be valued. And um, yeah, that, that's it for now. I will uh, place the uh, publication I mentioned in the chat box, and you can see, for example, the employment levels for each of the member states and for the UK, and, and maybe it might be interesting for you. So I will I'll place it there for you afterwards. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for keeping your time as well. I would like to remember to the panelists that if they go directly on the button of a Q&A, they can also reply directly to the persons, to the uh, uh, participants that uh, made their questions. And that can make it a bit easy because sometimes when we read uh, the questions, we do not know exactly to whom they can refer. So you can also try to do it by, by yourself. I saw that also Valeria already replied because it disappeared the question from, from the list. So it means that you already gave a reply by, in a private way, let's say. Okay, yeah. thank you for that, thanks. But um, I would also like to uh, make a question and I will uh, start with uh, Malika. Malika, I have a question for you. Uh, which cooperations are uh, vital to your organization with self-represented organizations of persons with disabilities, uh, with employers? What's, what, what, what's the way uh, you prefer working with in, uh, in your organization? Uh, Malika, I cannot see you. Let me see if I... Are you there with us? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Please. Euh, nous, nous souhaitons euh, travailler avec l'ensemble des partenaires, peu importe euh, qu'ils soient au cœur de l'emploi ou à l'extérieur de l'emploi. Certes, l'inclusion des personnes en situation de handicap passe euh, surtout par l'emploi, euh, pour ce qu'ils peuvent. C'est vrai que ça apporte le lien social, mes collègues l'ont signalé tout à l'heure, donc c'est très important. Ça apporte un autre regard dans le milieu professionnel, mais néanmoins dans la construction de l'offre, dans l'accompagnement, et dans les modalités qu'on doit disposer auprès de ces personnes, le regard de tous importe. Euh, la richesse de, de, de conseils d'administration de la structure de, de la GIFI passe essentiellement par l'apport des collèges associatifs. Dans les associations, elles sont plurielles. 
certes, les employeurs, que vous soyez une très petite entreprise, une moyenne, une grande, vous avez quand même pas mal de ressemblances. Les organisations syndicales salariées, euh, même en France, même effectivement, on a pas mal de, de courants syndicalistes, mais ça reste sur la thématique de l'emploi de, de des personnes en situation de handicap, des directives communes. C'est vrai que les associations apportent beaucoup. Et les associations apportent beaucoup au regard de leur expertise, de leur spécialisation, donc d'une manière euh, sur l'handicap, d'une part, mais par ailleurs, elles apportent beaucoup. La plupart des, des associations, elles sont au plus près du terrain. Et l'expérience et terrain euh, qui, euh, qui effectivement témoigne de la proximité des acteurs est extrêmement intéressante pour la prise en compte dans le cadre stratégique de notre gouvernance au sein de la GIFIP. Merci beaucoup, Mme. Merci pour votre intéressante et importante réponse. De l'autre côté, I had a question here, but it disappeared. It means that you already gave an answer. Um, yeah. I don't I cannot see it anymore. So it means that an answer have has been already uh, given uh, or by Jurgen or by uh, by also by Haydn because it was a question for both of them, but it's not here anymore. So, okay, and I have a question, uh, Jürgen, I want to ask you, uh, which would be the, the best manner to your mind for service providers and DPOs to incentivize, oh, sorry, incentivize an employer to bring on board staff with different abilities? Jürgen. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, no, it's, it's a very important question, of course. I mean, When you look at why companies are actually not employing people with disabilities, oftentimes we see it's a lack of awareness, uh, just or like uh, stereotypes that uh, again and again, people with disabilities are seen as people who are not able to work. That is like, of course, that's, that's a mental barrier, so to say, on the part of employers as an expression of wider health uh, perceptions in society and employers are a part of that. And of course, then also sometimes even if companies want to employ people with disabilities, they are afraid. They don't know how to do it. They're also afraid that uh, they might um, violate some, some legislation, some rule. So what, um, what we have seen in the Global Business and Disability Network is very much focusing on the benefits of a diverse and inclusive workforce more broadly, right? Including women, including ethnic minorities, religious minorities, LGBTI communities. And to, framing the discussion about disability inclusion in a wider DNI, diversity and inclusion context for companies has been quite successful. And I think uh, I mentioned the national business and disability networks because oftentimes well, mo most service providers, of course, uh, work on a, on, a, on a national level or not, There are many work on, working on a national level. So looking into where actually already these uh, national networks of inclusive or companies that want to become more inclusive exist and then entering the discussion there. And as I said, from a diversity and inclusion um, uh, perspective, but in any case, we see a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, company to company, employer to employer is always more effective, but giving these uh, the employers the, the tools and also the data that the disability uh, in increases diversity inclusion and with this also res uh, results in better business uh, performance that's that's key i think that's it thank you thank you very much uh, jürgen for your question uh Hayden, from from the floor as we are uh, all around europe i have a, a question coming from malta Um, uh, do you have any resources on the Maltese experience on, on job uh, carving? Go for it. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, the particular example on job carving, I can find some information. I think EASPD also have some information on it, if I'm not mistaken. but. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to forward it on. It was, uh, I had it in, in, in writing somewhere. So if you give me the relevant uh, email address, I'll, I'll forward on the information. To okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so the colleague from Malta can directly 
make the question, Chiara, you make directly the question to, to Haydn. So you will have more information about that. Um, okay, well, uh, I think that we went through four very important and interesting uh, uh, presentations. Uh, what, 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 what a good way to conclude. I mean, it's, uh, it's always very important and interesting what, what we speak about. But uh, I think that once again, we have to underline that persons with disabilities are really the focus around which uh, all the stakeholders have, have to be. Uh, so um, again, uh, we shouldn't just uh, think of persons with disabilities during conferences. We, we have to think about them uh, exactly in the same way we think about our way of working. Um, he, our colleague from EDF said, why we follow, why we need a job. It's part of society, exactly that. It's not about only money or whatever. It's, uh, it's part of our life. Usually when we meet a person, which is the first question, one of the first, which is your job? What are you doing in your life? And I think that that makes uh, the importance of being part of, uh, of our society. Um, don't forget that uh, uh, when uh, uh, WHO wants to make, uh, uh, to know how many, how much is uh, respected and taken uh, in consideration the, um, the United Nations Convention, one of the first monitoring is about employing of persons with disability. So I think it's really center part of our, of our life. Um, well, uh, that said, um, I think that I can give back the floor to Jim for something that is also quite important, very important in part of, of our, our uh, conference. So, and about SPD as well. So Jim, I give back the floor to you. You are muted. Thank you very much, Fabrizio, and thank you very much to those uh, presenters. I think uh, four very good and differing perspectives on the issues of, of employment. So very, very good, and, and thank you for those. Um, now we have an opportunity to, to make a little celebration. Uh, we can't do it quite in the way that we would together as a group. Uh, this is the celebration of our Employment for All Awards 2020. I think this is the fourth occasion on which we have done this. The last opportunity was in Belfast a couple of years ago, where we undertook the activity for the awards together with uh, our good colleagues in EUS, the Un European Union of Supported Employment. And today uh, we are doing it in collaboration with REDACT. Um, we uh, invited organizations uh, to make a nomination uh, for uh, their contribution people with disabilities. I uh, did that just before uh, the Christmas break or just after, and we had an extremely good response. We looked at uh, all of the um, uh, applications very carefully. We had a panel of experts in this field who looked at each of the applications. Uh, we were looking for things that were innovative, that were creative, um, that uh, showed us uh, a good way forward. Um, why are we doing the awards? Because Article 27 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled Peoples Persons recognizes the right of persons with disabilities to work. And sometimes those organizations and individuals that we know who work day in, day out, helping people with disabilities into a job are not so good at letting everyone know what they do. So this is our opportunity to uh, put a spotlight 
on the work of some key organizations in different locations within Europe. It's our way to celebrate your actions and to put a spotlight on your work. And we hope that, that, like us, you will be inspired as delegates by the stories of our 2020 award winners, their creativity and their ambition to make a difference. Now, you hopefully can see the screen which lists the organisations have, who have been shortlisted. You will see, and if you don't, I will work through them quickly. Uh, we have two categories for the shortlist. First of all, we have support service providers. And secondly, we have businesses. In the first category for support service providers, we have three uh, organizations who have been identified by our experts. GAFA, Job Coaching in Austria, Barcelona, the Network for Labor Inclusion, and from Denmark, we have Rev Clap Job. And then for business organizations, we have Eka and Tohom from Turkey, Grupo Sifo from Spain, and from Ireland, we have the Now Group. So. Gaffer from Austria as the support service provider. I hope you will join with me in giving them a clap from your location. And uh, we will um, invite Daffer and representatives of Daffer to join with us, hopefully at our next live conference in Ireland in October. We now move to the winner for the businesses category. I think we will have a drum roll again. And the award winner is Grupo Sifo. So congratulations to uh, Grupo Sifo and uh, thank both Grupo Sifo and DAFO for their work. I will say a, a word about both organizations. Uh, just to uh, introduce them. DAFO from Austria works in the region of Vorarlberg, the lovely region of Vorarlberg. Its objective is to secure employment for disadvantaged people. They seek, quote, paid, meaningful and productive employment and which they seek to reflect in their activities and the job seekers perspective. They provide youth coaching, vocational training assistance, work assistance and coaching. And they say that the direction of their work is that all of our activities aim towards the open labor market. We want the people that we support to be treated equally to other employers and to receive the same wage. And uh, a quick statistic for you, in 2019, they succeeded in getting 63% of the people they support into, uh, into gaining and maintaining and or maintaining their employment. So that is a little, a few words about uh, DAFOR. Uh, you will, uh, if you're participating in workshops tomorrow, learn more about them, uh, about their activities. And now a word about Grupo Sifo, business award winner. Uh, Grupo Sifo uh, started in Barcelona, uh, the wonderful city of Barcelona, created in 1993. Uh, it has now spread its service across all regions of Spain and to two locations in France. It employs 4, 000, over 4,500 people. 89% of those people, people have a range of disabilities. And of the total, 31% of their employees have what they describe as high needs. Um, 
It is a facility services company. So it provides uh, janitorial services, uh, support services to uh, companies across uh, the localities that they're based in. Uh, they seek a real wage for Sifu, uh, for their employees. Um, and the average salary, salary of their employees um, was approx approximately 14,000 euros per annum. And that is, I am told, 10.7% greater than the minimum wage in Spain. So their mission as an organization is to promote people with disabilities into employment. So again, uh, I offer my sincere congratulations to, uh, to uh, Grupo Sifo and to Defu uh, to thank the other shortlisted organizations. Um, it's always very difficult making these choices in this situation. I, I feel for the experts who had to select the, the two successful organizations. Um, uh, we're sorry that we can't uh, provide a, a cocktail or a refreshment to celebrate uh, the, the, the award, uh, but hopefully if both organizations are able to come to Cork and our conference in Cork proceeds, uh, we, will, uh, they, we, we will be very pleased to welcome there and to draw attention again to their reward. So I think um, now it turns, it's my turn to hand back to Fabrizio. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Yes, congratulations to all of them, of course. Um, and once again, I would like to thank uh, a lot uh, our uh, panelists. Uh, I would like to thank Malika, Jürgen, Valeria and Haydn uh, for their presentations, for having been with us. And um, well, it was great to work together with you. Thank you again. Thank you for all, for all your time with us. Uh, well, where are we going now? Uh, we should have had some music, but uh, our artist uh, coming uh, from, from uh, uh, hung Hungary, she had some uh, problems at her home, so she's not with us anymore, unfortunately. So this said, uh, I will uh, uh, introduce you our next work that it will be in the afternoon from uh, one to two, and we have three workshops. First workshop is uh, uh, from, as you can see on the screen, from education to employment. There is, is provided a French interpretation. Second workshop, it's uh, using state aid to boost employment. And the third workshop is inclusive living, housing and DI linked to employment. In this case, we have the, uh, it's provided the Croatian interpretation. Once again, I would like to remind you that Croatian is linked uh, uh, in a very strange geographical way to the Spanish flag, but it's not Spanish, okay? Uh, another thing that I would like to remind you, give a look also in your spam because as you know, um, the, the links to the workshop have been sent to you via email uh, and they are in the chat and can be found also on the app. But you never know, sometimes uh, uh, these emails uh, just go down to the spam. So I should uh, close the first session, the first morning of this uh, uh, conference in a very good way. I am very glad because we are exactly in, uh, in time, uh, what we thought to be. And so uh, we will meet again uh, all together tomorrow at the same time, 10 a.m., for a new plenary session focusing on policy uh, issues. You already know how to join us. And so have a good uh, afternoon, uh, a good day again, and see you tomorrow all together. Goodbye.